Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to thank you all for uh, participating in our event, in our 10th uh, International Conference for Multinationals, organized by Trent Ross Watanabe, with the assistance of Baker McKenzie, our partner uh, law firm. Uh, I would also, uh, so we are going to talk about a very important issue for uh, Brazilian and, or, and multinational companies operating in Brazil, which is criminal liability of uh, officers and, and employees of companies uh, due to anti-competitive conduct, especially cartel behavior. Uh, this is a very interesting topic because criminal liability is not a very is not very common for anti for competitive for anti-competitive misconduct across the globe. I mean, only a few countries do have criminal liability for cartel behavior, and we have Brazil as one of these uh, countries, and also the United States. Uh, so they have this, uh, this special feature. In the United States, there is already a significant track record of criminal persecution for cartel conduct. And in Brazil, this is increasingly important. And the Brazilian authorities, of course, uh, they are very keen on learning from its US counterparts. In the past two decades, there were several cases that were investigated both in Brazil and in the United States, especially some of uh, which were, uh, which started with leniency applications. Uh, so immunity applications by global companies operating in, in several countries, and they applied for immunity in several jurisdictions uh, in order to obtain either uh, no penalties or a discount in their penalties in exchange for confessing its participation in a global cartel and also submitting evidence about the participation of other companies and other individuals. In many of these cases, uh, the organization of the uncovered scheme resembled what we see in the movies like a, myth, a, a mafia meeting, right? A dark room in a hotel or in an airport with a group of men smoking and talking and discussing about how to allocate the market in terms of clients and regions or to fix prices of a specific good. And several, in several of these cases, these were the kinds of uh, arrangement that was uncovered by, especially by the applications of global companies. But uh, more recently, both in the United States and in Brazil, the authorities are focusing on domestic cartels, cartels are uh, investigating arrangements that are more within the territory of the country, especially in bid rigging cases where uh, companies uh, agree to uh, uh, defraud uh, the, 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 uh, a proceeding, a public procurement proceeding in order to avoid competing among themselves. And in most of these cases, these local cases, we have criminal enforcement as the norm. You, we often have a, a, a criminal enforcement against individuals, especially against individuals that uh, allegedly participated in these arrangements involving a bid rigging scheme or other local cartels. But nowadays, uh, leaving a little bit aside that picture of a man in dark room smoking and trying to allocate uh, the markets among themselves, Actually, the authorities are now focusing on new kinds of potential collusive agreements among companies, considering that nowadays we have a new technological scenario with, with several uh, communications methods and also uh, trading environments that are based on electronic platforms. And in these trading environments, we have a lot of transactions that are organized by algorithms or artificial intelligence. And nowadays, the authorities are thinking on how the criminal liability will uh, be affected or actually how it will apply in these very special and new situations where a lot of the trading is not between human beings, but actually between computers. And these kind of cases are already taking place in Brazil and in the United States. And criminal liability is also part of this, uh, of this kind of enforcement. So, this, so these developments over the last two decades uh, bring some questions for companies and uh, its collaborators and then its employees, its officers and so on. 
how can multinational companies establish compliance programs that are appropriate to local peculiarities, including criminal liability, which is not a, a feature that is so common in, 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 in many countries, but they are common, they are an important feature in Brazil and the United States. How to deal with uh, the compliance challenges derived from this new technological reality? How to provide appropriate guarantees to employees without giving incentives for misbehavior that can result in problems for the company? Moreover, another issue is if a misconduct is found, how to deal with an employee that did not follow the company's rules and the compliance program, but whose collaboration can be important for the company to apply for immunity, to apply for, uh, to submit an initial application and try to avoid penalties or at least obtain a discount in the penalties. And finally, how to deal uh, in legal regimes where we have not only a, the criminal uh, investigation, especially involving individuals, but also in parallel, we have administrative investigation involving the company and also the individual. So how to cope with these uh, two parallel kinds of investigations that are common, especially in Brazil. These are very important issues. And in order to discuss that, we are going to talk to very, uh, uh, very two great lawyers that are specialists on these issues. And we have the pleasure to count on them on their experience to, to discuss these issues with us. Uh, we have Creighton Macy, uh, our colleague from the US. He is the chair of Baker McKenzie's North America Antitrust and Competition Practice. He has extensive experience representing clients in a wide variety of antitrust matters, including mergers and acquisitions, investigations by the United States Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission, private litigation and counseling on issues such as antitrust compliance. Before joining the firm, Creighton was an enforcer. He, uh, he served as the chief of staff and senior counsel in the Department of Justice Antitrust Division, working as a senior advisor to the acting assistant attorney general on civil and criminal antitrust enforcement and policy matters, as well as budget and personal issues. During Creighton's time at the DOJ, the Antitrust Division undertook an unprecedented volume of high profile civil and criminal matters. So he has a lot of experience both in the government when he acted in the government at the Department of Justice of the United States and now at the firm acting uh, as uh, an attorney. And also we have João Gameiro. Uh, he's a partner of the firm since 2018. He has over a decade of experience in criminal law and compliance. He's a defense attorney and he presents several multinational companies and their shareholders and directors in police investigations, criminal lawsuits, administrative proceedings, and congressional investigations. He has published extensively about criminal investigations and corporate compliance issues and holds uh, a bachelor and a master's degree from the University of Sao Paulo. And actually, uh, his thesis in his master's degree is about a criminal, uh, uh, the criminal aspects of cartel investigation. So we have two great experts here to talk about these issues uh, for us. And I would like to pass the word to, to Creighton so that he can explain a little bit how things work in the United States. How, what are the main features of antitrust, of criminal enforcement involving anti-competitive conduct, especially cartel behavior in the United States. Creighton, with you. Paolo, thank you so much. And it's really wonderful to be joining you and Zhao today. And what an awesome introduction, by the way. I'm hoping that I can get a video of that and play that before all of my meetings just to, to, to pump myself up. That is so, <laughs> it's, it's, it's wonderful to be here and particularly to be talking about such an important topic. You know, we, we obviously, uh, there's a whole breadth of different things we could talk about with respect to antitrust enforcement. And today I think is one of the most important topics and that's antitrust enforcement that's criminal, that's relating to companies, that's relating to individuals and the different trends that are occurring as well as the differences and similarities in different jurisdictions around the world. Because that I think is the most, one of the most important things to mention and the DOJ with the International Competition Network and other antitrust jurisdictions around the world have been continuously making progress of how, given that we could be in one jurisdiction, but it has global implications. And those global implications, sometimes people think, okay, well, 
of course, a merger transaction might have companies all around the world. And you might have transactions where it hits sales all around the world. Well, people should also realize that, Paolo, as you, you very wonderfully said at the beginning and correctly, that cartels and antitrust is one in a whole host of jurisdictions around the world. And two, there's a tremendous international component of it. It operates both within domestic borders as well as international borders. So I think that's the first thing. And, and I think you really hit on that, that wanted to highlight. I know we'll get into it a little bit more. The second thing I wanted to discuss in just in general is that going back to what we've seen both in the United States as well as internationally. And, and Paolo, you mentioned it earlier in saying, we've seen a host of international cartels that have implications in Latin America, in Asia, in, the, in North America, all over the world, in Europe, and how the different regulators have worked together internationally. We've also seen a focus, of course, on domestic related activities. Now that doesn't mean something that domestic can have international components of it, right? Many companies around the world have domestic and international capabilities, obviously, because companies operate globally. But one thing that's interesting is, is Paolo, to your comment that, that a lot of people have been thinking about is that are the antitrust regulators and enforcers around the world with their previous past really large transaction, really large uh, fines, really international cases. And now that we're seeing those, we've seen a whole host of them, although I'd probably say for the last 15 years. Now that we're seeing more domestic cases as well, and we always did see domestic cases, what does it show? Does it show that, and I know we're going to talk about this later in terms of compliance, and the importance of compliance, but does it show that companies are really taking note of some of these international conspiracies and thinking about how can we get better and how can we in, improve our compliance so that we're not engaged in, in these actions? So I think that's an important thing. I think the other thing to think about though is the process here. And, and I, I, the antitrust division celebrated a few years ago its 25th anniversary of the leniency program. The leniency program is something that I think is extremely important because as, as, it, as you mentioned earlier, it's, it's antitrust at least a while ago happened in what we call smoke-filled rooms. And so the importance of having and incentivizing leniency, and what that means is in the United States as well as others around the world, incentivizing folks and companies that think or know that they're involved in anti-competitive conduct to go to the Justice Department and say, I'd like to apply for leniency. I'd like to, and potentially get protection from that based on my cooperation. And I'm interested in hearing from Paolo and Zhao later because many different jurisdictions around the world today have some kind of component of that. What that essentially means, and it applies to both companies and individuals, even though for the most part you see companies applying for leniency. Essentially that means if you find anti-competitive conduct and you think that you have engaged in anti-competitive conduct, you can pick up the phone and you can call the Justice Department and say, I'd like to apply for a marker. I think there is conduct in this area, in this location, this is a little bit about it. I'd like to put down a marker and over the next several 30 days or next several months, I'd like to work to show you that there is anti-competitive conduct indeed, that it is relating to the United States and that in, in response to that, I'd like to secure what's called leniency. And for someone who is the leniency recipient, that can reduce fines, it can, well, it can ameliorate fines and jail time for individuals, among other things, that have applied to that. And then you have a whole host of people as the investigation opens and deciding whether to cooperate or not to cooperate and the implications of that. But to, to sum it all up, the individual is incredibly important in all this. And I don't think it's fair to say, it is fair to say, actually, that 
the individual is part of each anti-competitive conduct, right? And it's also something that the DOJ, and I know others in Brazil too, in our really wonderful planning sessions has focused on, and that is pursuing individuals for the conduct, in particular pursuing individuals that have led the conduct and played a key role in it. An example in that, and before I turn it, turn it back to you, Paolo, because I, as you all know, I'm a big nerd here and I love to ramble. So at any time, just stop me or just play that really awesome video. Okay. So, but the last point is to okay. give everyone, to give everyone a sense for some of the liability for individuals in December, 2019, relating to a case that was called the tuna price fixing case, an executive who used to be the CEO of a tuna company was sentenced to 40 months in jail and to pay a hundred thousand criminal fine for leadership in an antitrust conspiracy to fix prices of canned tuna. Now that that went through a trial, the Justice Department won at trial, and let's say the just say the Justice Department asked for well over 40 months of jail time for this individual. That highlights again. I think it's fair to say that it's a trend, but it's a continued trend. The Justice Department, just like Kajay and others, are going to pursue this conduct, not only companies, but also individuals. So I'll stop there because you know I can really ramble. There's a lot going on. We could talk about procurement. We could talk about all these different cases. But I definitely want to hear your, Paolo and Zhao, your perspective. <laughs> Thank you, Creighton. Uh, and of course, uh, to everybody in the audience, I mean, if you have any question, you can make this question through the Q&A uh, button at, at the Zoom interface and we are, I'm actually following this. So if you have any question about to, to any of the speakers, please send your questions and we will be, we will have uh, time to, to discuss uh, issues that you, you might have. All right. So uh, very interesting, Creighton. I mean, thank you very much for this explanation about uh, this, the trends in cartel enforcement in the United States. I think we could now pass the word to, to Joao to talk a little bit about how criminal enforcement uh, happens in Brazil and then I can include some details about the administrative uh, aspects of these, of these enforcements that uh, affect also companies, not only individuals, but are also important for individuals. Joao? Thank you, Paulo. Uh, thank you, Creighton, for accepting our invitation to take part of this panel. Uh, and I would like to thank everybody that is with, are with us. Uh, thank you for uh, spending some time to listen to us and to discuss some ideas uh, with our firm. Uh, and I would like to uh, take my part, start my part with uh, information that Creighton provides to us about the, the importance of the limits agreements uh, in cartel cases. Uh, we all know that uh, both in the US and in Brazil, limits agreements, they were always uh, a key element to investigate uh, and to punish individuals and companies that engaged in cartel conduct because it brings an instant instability for the agreement between the competitors. Uh, it makes all, all of the participants of the cartel uh, a suspicious individual. Uh, and this was what we had in Brazil uh, during over the last years. Uh, I believe that I can speak for Paulo in the sense that Kaji was very successful uh, in investigating and bringing charges against uh, companies and also uh, the Brazilian uh, prosecutors, both in the state and federal level, they build uh, a lot of cases based on the evidence collected by Kaji that was collected uh, in the course of living agreements. So we cannot discuss cartel conduct and uh, uh, the enforcement against cartel without talking about those agreements. The problem that I believe that we had in Brazil in the last years, and this is a problem that we will have to address and will impact all the strategy of the Brazilian authorities, uh, is uh, the result of some agreements that we saw in the Operation Car Wash uh, during the, uh, these years. Uh, 
This is public uh, information that we saw in the newspapers that uh, the prosecutors, uh, the Controller General of Brazil and uh, other agencies, they, they signed different business agreements with companies and the individuals that were involved in the Operation Car Wash. But after some time that everybody started looking uh, to these agreements uh, with a more calm way, uh, everybody realized that uh, companies, they were really impacted by uh, these agreements. We all know that different companies, they, are, uh, they went to insolvency uh, due to these agreements. There are a lot of discussions about how these companies are going to pay the fines and all the compensations that were established in those agreements. And in the other hand, some individuals, they paid uh, fines that were not so high. Uh, they did not have any jail time. Uh, they have some alternative penalties in the criminal sphere. And some of them are back in positions in other companies, uh, in good positions as executives of uh, high profile companies. Uh, and then we have the discussion, what we did with some key Brazilian companies that uh, we have some Brazilian companies that uh, were able to compete with European, uh, European and US companies uh, in foreign uh, projects. And now they are struggling to uh, get uh, the job done here in Brazil. And on the other hand, we have some a feeling of uh, injustice regarding the individuals. Um, at the same time, uh, and uh, I, I would try to talk a little bit about uh, Creighton uh, uh, material here, because uh, in, if I'm not wrong, in 2015, uh, the DOJ, uh, they have a, a so-called Yates memo that was like a guideline for the prosecutors of DOJ, they, that they should go after not only the companies, but also the individuals involved in wrongdoings. Because most important would be to punish individuals, so these behaviors would not be reproduced in the future. Uh, and I believe that this memo that we are talking in 2015, uh, it has a large impact over the Brazilian authorities. Uh, during the Operation Car Wash, we know that Brazilian prosecutors, they were talking with U.S. prosecutors. We have a lot of collaboration. Uh, and uh, the Brazilian legal system uh, is trying to adopt a lot of instruments that uh, we see in the U.S. So I, I believe that uh, the criminal authorities here in Brazil, uh, they will focus on individuals based not only in the U.S. experience, but also in the results that we saw in the Operation uh, Car Wash. So I believe that uh, we won't have what we had in the past uh, with companies paying uh, some large fines to CAGI uh, and individuals receiving immunity in the criminal sphere, because this is very important to stress. If you sign a business agreement here in Brazil, you can receive immunity not only for the company in the administrative sphere, but also for the individuals in the criminal sphere. Uh, and we know that in some cases, uh, the company paid the fines on behalf of the individuals, it, not only the administrative fine, but also the criminal fine. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I believe what I can say is that we are going to see a lot of changes here in Brazil, especially in this focus on individuals uh, and in this uh, position of the Brazilian authorities not to let someone get away with murder, uh, with the company paying fines, and after one year you have the same executive uh, in another position in a different company. So this brings the importance uh, not only uh, of compliance inside the companies, but also uh, an approach of the Brazilian companies to demand a compliance program and a compliance approach of the companies when they enter into a lease agreement. Thank you, João. Very interesting. I think I can uh, just make some comments over uh, what João has said. I mean, 
as he mentioned, uh, the first authority actually in Brazil to have a leniency program clearly inspired on the uh, experience of the United States that were that has started 25 years ago was Cadi. Cadi started to execute leniency agreements in 2003, uh, and then since then has executed several leniency leniency uh, agreements. Many many of them with companies that also executed leniency agreements with the US DOJ. Uh, and uh, a very important aspect is that, I mean, in principle, this was executed only by CADE, and then CADE found out that, well, in order to provide more security, more uh, legal certainty to the individuals of the companies, we'll also have bring together with us the criminal authorities, the, both the federal prosecutors or the state prosecutors, depending on the peculiarities of the case, to uh, execute the agreements together with us. Uh, this is not required by law, but back like 13, 14 years ago, Cadi started to do that, to have, to coordinate the administrative sphere and also the criminal sphere. And then several, uh, uh, and then the criminal authorities started to obtain a lot of evidence about criminal behavior and started to investigate the other companies that did not execute, the other individuals actually, uh, that did not execute the leniency agreements to, uh, for cartel behavior. And now we have more and more cases about that. Uh, I think Lava Jato certainly has many issues that are currently being discussed in, in, in criminal courts. And actually this kind of discussions will also affect the administrative uh, proceeding against individuals and companies. Uh, for example, Cade very recently started to uh, first request the leniency applicant to present its final uh, submission within the administrative sphere and then let the other defendants to submit their, their, uh, def their final arguments in the administrative sphere. So emulating a recent decision of the federal Supreme Court in a uh, car wash case. So this kind of so the criminal sphere and the administrative sphere, they interfere in each other. And this will, this will continue to be the case and has several implications for companies act, active in Brazil and for its employees and executives. Uh, how to deal with that beforehand by establishing an appropriate leniency program that can detect inappropriate behavior, deal up first, avoid, try to mitigate the risk of inappropriate behavior occurring, uh, but when it occurs, how to mitigate, how to deal with the issue, and so on. And I think we could talk a little bit about compliance programs, uh, Creighton. I mean, there, there has been some very interesting recent developments in the United States about compliance programs. And I think, again, this kind of development will be seen by Brazilian authorities and may also uh, inspire some initiatives here in Brazil. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a great point in both what what Paolo and Yao, you said were is is exactly right. And you know what's really interesting is is that in December of 2019, uh, actually earlier, it started to be implemented. The press release was in July 2019, and then there was more speeches and discussions about it. But in particular, last year the DOJ antitrust division for the first time noted that it will consider compliance at the charging stage in criminal antitrust investigations charge, which is reflected and they noted this in the justice manual. So the division also announced re re kind of some revisions to the manual and a guide to the prosecutors and how they evaluate corporate's compliance programs. So I'll discuss that in a bit because that's really the crux. But what's important here is that taking compliance into account at both the charging stage, deciding how to charge, when to charge, things along those lines, in addition to the sentencing phase, was particularly notable for the Justice Department Antitrust Division because it's a new policy. And other policies within the, anti with, within the Department of Justice other sections had compliance related policies. Uh, so this was a big deal, particularly for companies. And what it essentially did was highlighted the, imp the fact that the antitrust division would take into account compliance in charging decisions is the importance, of course, 
compliance. We all know that it's in compliance. It particularly put folks on notice that it's in particularly important. Uh, you know, the Justice Department Antitrust Division could say they, they've, of course, we've been focusing on, we've got our leniency program. We've got, we've been pursuing companies. We've been focusing on individuals for a long time. But putting this into practice, I think it means a lot. And also, it's truly key what the takeaways are here. And I want to, I want to, in it, that's what I think, and I, I want to, Paolo and Jao, get your, your perspective on this, because I want to run through this, because it's actually, the importance about it is not that there is, you can get compliance credit at a charging stage, or regardless, it's really what it means, because regardless if you're dealing with a, a criminal antitrust issue, a civil antitrust issue, compliance is really helpful, not only mitigating issues when they occurred, but stopping them from occurring. So I wanted to read these, what we call keys to compliance, because I think they're really helpful. These nine factors, and then I'll turn it back to you. And, and so one is design and comprehensiveness of the antitrust related policies and procedures. Two, culture of compliance. That is particularly important, particularly for individuals, whether you're an executive, a mid-level employee, or a really important employee at any stage. Three, responsibility for the compliance program. Is it serious? Is there someone that has responsibility for it? Four, risk assessment. Is it more than just a compliance program? Are you looking at information? Are you looking at metrics? Are you helping detect whether they're actual violations or not? Is it a real program? Five, this is another one particularly important for individuals, training and communication. Do employees understand it? Is it top down? Is it something more than just put on the intranet for employees to either see or not see? Six, periodic review, monitoring, and auditing. Of course, that speaks for itself. Who evaluates it? Is it being effective? Seven, reporting. Is there a reporting system in place? Again, incredibly important for employees. Do you know if you see an antitrust issue, how can, what can we do? How can we report it? Eight, incentives and discipline. Are, what are, the, are there penalties or are there rewards to people following, individuals following the program, knowing it, following it, reporting on it? And last, remediation and the role, role of the compliance program in this discovery of the violation. Is the compliance program actually helpful and is it in helpful in discovering the different antitrust related conduct, whether it's conduct or not? We, wanna, we want to know how employees can flag these issues and bring them to the proper channels. So I'll just go back there and say, there's all types of ways to implement these things. And I don't think in the US, as well as Paolo and Zhao elsewhere, you can stress the importance now of really focusing on having a living, breathing compliance program evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Every company is different, products, people, resources, but having that, implementing that, having a top-down approach and a culture to it so your employees are aware of it can be crucially important, not only to companies, but as we're focusing on individuals. Yeah. Thank you, Creighton. That's, that's very interesting. This recent trends of acknowledging the value of compliance program by, by companies that can actually reduce fines, reduce the charges and so on, this is a very interesting trends in, 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 the, in the United States. I mean, I can talk a little bit about the administrative sphere here in Brazil. Maybe uh, João can uh, afterwards speak a little bit about uh, the criminal aspects of that. But uh, uh, in Brazil, we didn't reach this stage yet. Uh, CADE does have a document, CADE, the Brazilian Antitrust Authority, does have uh, a compliance guide guidelines to, to instruct companies that operate in Brazil to instruct, you know, to consider the Brazilian rules in order to structure their respective uh, compliance programs. But when it comes to, well, if a company has a compliance program uh, and if a violation is found, what are the effects of this compliance program in the company? Uh, so we have now in the United States, we have a clear benefit, right? I mean, uh, I can not charge you, uh, the company, for this fine, but a lower fine, and the individual for instead of 
20 months in jail, maybe 15 months in jail, right? I mean, so it's, you can count on that in order, in, this is a clear benefit for the company and a more, a, a clearer incentive for the company to establish its own compliance program. We still do not have this uh, in Brazil. Uh, so the guidelines issued by CADE, they do provide, well, compliance is important, it's important for the company in order to avoid having uh, antitrust problems. Uh, it, if they it's also important for them to find if there is a problem and if they find early, they can be the first one to come and obtain immunity or they can uh, have sufficient evidence to transact, to, to settle the case at CADE and obtain a discount and so on. Uh, but when it comes to a sentencing guideline, so to say, or, or to defining the penalty of a company and the individuals, it doesn't, it doesn't provide, it doesn't provide details. I mean, in other areas of Brazilian federal enforcement, for example, anti-corruption, there are guidelines for that. In antitrust, it's not the case yet, at least. CADE has not established uh, a, a clear benefit for companies uh, that have compliance programs and also the effects of this in the penalties applied to, to, to individuals. And recently, CADE has issued draft guidelines on, on the calculation of fines for cartel, for cartel cases. Uh, it has established many criteria and, and aspects, but it, it did not provide a specific benefit for companies that have compliance programs in place. I mean, there are some very general uh, references that, well, it can be a demonstration of good faith of the company, and this is one of the parameters established by law in order to calculate the, the amount of the fine. But this is very general. It's not a, as a concrete benefit as the recent uh, guidelines issued by, by the DOJ. So we still do not have this guidance. I don't know if João would like to talk a little bit about uh, criminal issues. Uh, yeah, Paulo, uh, what Creighton brought here, I believe it's very important uh, when we talk about Brazilian law too, because uh, first of all, when we talk about criminal liability in Brazil, we talk essentially about the liability of individuals. Uh, in Brazil, uh, companies, they are just uh, criminally liable when we talk about environmental crimes. Uh, in case of a cartel, we are talking about so uh, just uh, individuals they can be charged and can receive a criminal penalty. So when the judge will analyze the conduct of a certain individual, uh, he will not take into account if the company had a compliance program, how was the uh, the corporate structure, etc. Uh, but uh, there is a, a large advantage for companies that have a, a solid. Uh, and robust uh, compliance program because when you have this program, you establish responsibilities, duties uh, of all your structure. Uh, we know that uh, most of our, our clients, we are talking here to multinational companies, it's very difficult for uh, an authority to identify who is the individual responsible for each department and for each decision. Uh, and what we are seeing in Brazil is that uh, criminal authorities, they are using uh, a lot of the so-called uh, Teoria do Domínio do Fato. It's like uh, the control of the fact theory. And uh, based on this theory, the criminal enforcement agents will say that uh, if you have a, a structure, a hierarchical structure that uh, causes a crime, that there are some situations where you cannot say that the CISO, the, the high level executives, they are not aware of that decision and that something occur uh, in, inside the company without their knowledge. Uh, th there are a lot of critics against this uh, theory, but th this is a theory that authorities are using. So we have to deal with this uh, uh, reality. But when the company has this corporate uh, compliance program, you can use this compliance program also as a defense for uh, the CISO uh, and uh, high level executives, because they will have some concrete uh, documents, uh, concrete evidence to show the authorities that they did their best to avoid the company to engage into uh, an anti-competitive conduct 
uh, they did their best not to let the employees uh, engage in a crime. So uh, this proactive uh, position is very important when we talk, when we talk uh, in the long term uh, and to avoid any liability to executives that were not anyhow involved in any wrongdoing. So this is a side effect of compliance programs that I believe that all of uh, our clients have to take into account when they will make the decision to invest in a compliance program or not. Thank you, John. This is, this is a very interesting issue because, um, I mean, the standards in, in criminal sphere, they are, they are higher, of course, than in the administrative sphere, but uh, what we see before cutting the administrative uh, investigations is that uh, we do also need to have this kind of evidence showing that this individual did not, had nothing to do with the, with the conduct of uh, uh, of that is being investigated. Maybe, maybe there was a problem, but instead of, and, and that's, that's a very peculiar uh, trend at CADE's investigations. I mean, CADE often includes five, 10 individuals of a company uh, as investigated parties in, in a specific conduct. So like anybody, for example, there's a leniency application, the leniency applicant brings a lot of emails, and these emails have many people that are uh, copied and then Cadi brings all those people that were copied in the emails as parts of the investigations. And then, and then in order to explain, look, I mean, okay, this guy was copied. Maybe he had some knowledge about what's going on, but I mean, he didn't take any active behavior to arrange the cartel, to fix prices and so on. Uh, and then having a compliance program that can register the, the, the responsibilities of each individual also can be helpful at the administrative sphere. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would just say, Paolo, as you know, and, and Yao, Jao, that um, it's a similar process in, in the United States in terms of prosecutors like to review documents. They like to speak with witnesses. They like to get as complete of a story as possible. Uh, they need to put together a potential case, regardless if it's, uh, you know, what's the posture of the companies in the industry. So I think the point is, that it's these individuals uh, and documents and potential witnesses are going to help a company or an individual, of course, seeking leniency. Uh, the DOJ will need them to put together a case and to try if it, even if they need to try it and go all, you know, go to try it in front of a jury. So very similar in the US, even though I know that the processes are a little bit different. I think you're seeing that and, and Paolo and Joe, I'm getting the sense around the world that is getting more and more of the norm. Folks wanting a lot of documents and folks wanting to, regulators wanting a lot of documents and wanting to speak with a lot of people. Yeah, and then uh, that, that's, this trend brings uh, another benefit of, of having a, a, an important uh, well-structured compliance program because uh, and that, that's, uh, there are situations, well, that you, you find that an employee did something wrong. Uh, so, and he knew that he, this was wrong and he did something wrong. And then, uh, uh, so the good thing is that you found it because maybe another colleague uh, uh, obtained information about this misconduct of, the, of this specific person and then uh, uh, sent, uh, called the, the, the hotline, the compliance hotline, informed the company, then you could have an internal investigation, collect evidence and find that actually that specific employee was doing something wrong, was arranging a cartel with competitors and so on. Uh, well, you may have the incentive to simply fire this individual, but the problem is you will need to collect evidence to provide, if you want to apply for leniency, that's another issue. But if you want to cooperate with the authorities, you will need the assistance of this individual to uh, gather evidence in order to, to benefit the company. So uh, a compliance program also uh, uh, can have standards in order to, how do I tackle this uh, difficult balance, which is, well, I have to provide incentives for, for individuals not to commit any misconduct, but if they commit anything wrong, 
I have to provide some, uh, and at least have some internal guidance what to do with him or her, uh, in the sense that uh, if, if I might need the cooperation of this individual to defend the company and to benefit and to get lower fines and, and or even immunity and so on, and to, to avoid uh, further problems to, to, to the company. Uh, and to avoid the situation as happened, as Rome said, of some companies uh, in the car wash case, where well, the company was really badly damaged, but the, the individuals not necessarily so. Absolutely. Uh, and Paul and Creighton, another thing that uh, I was thinking about when uh, we started the discussion, uh, th this is funny because uh, at the same time that you have some companies that try to put together an international car international cartel uh, and to achieve a, a larger uh, gain uh, with the illicit conduct. At the same time, they have to deal with different authorities in different countries. So, and we came to some situations in, in the context of the Operation Car Wash where the DOJ was evaluating the compliance program of the company here in Brazil uh, under the Brazilian jurisdiction. So uh, when, we, when we think about the, the global world that we are living and with all the authorities talking with each other and all the authorities adopting uh, uh, similar instruments of enforcement, uh, we are also seeing that all the authorities, they have similar standards of uh, ev to evaluate uh, the companies and the individuals, both in the administrative and in the criminal sphere. So uh, when a company uh, put together a compliance program here in Brazil, thinking about only the Brazilian reality, uh, this company can also have again in the future if uh, the company has any problem in another jurisdiction. So uh, some measures that companies can take today can bring a benefit in the future that may be uh, off the radar. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yes, uh, I think we are going to, to the end of our, of our panel. Uh, so I think basically we discussed the main features of still uh, cartel enforcement and the U.S. cartel enforcement, some, some recent trends in both jurisdictions. I don't know, Creighton, if you would like to, to say some final words about uh, about about our discussion uh, and then yeah. Augusto, and then uh, we can conclude. Of course, I mean, again, we still have some minutes. If you have any question, you can send through the, the Q&A uh, button at, at, at Zoom. Yeah. Well, thank you, Paolo. First of all, I would just say a, a big thanks to you and Zhao, even though, uh, please forgive my pronunciations, and the, and the whole Trench team, because it's really wonderful to be here with two friends and colleagues. And so that, that has been really wonderful for me, and also everyone who joined. Uh, I think that these, in some, I think we hit on all of the, the issues, the important issues here. And in particular, I think that what, what we discussed was the trends are important, but one thing that is constant, and that is that whether it's international or domestic, the regulators and the enforcers in, the enforcers in the United States around the world are focusing on hardcore antitrust conduct. They're also focusing on the civil conduct, of course. They're focusing on price fixing. They're focusing on bid rigging. They're focusing on market allocation. They always will. And so whether there's a trend or not, they're focusing on public procurement. They're focusing on these issues and they always will. So that goes into the second point, which I think we just talked about and goes hand in hand is how we can work to one proactively through compliance measures and a really a buy-in from companies and individuals, how we can proactively stop or at least mitigate any of these, these issues before they arise, one. And two, if they do rise, how are we prepared to, like we just discussed, be in a position where we can be the ones to make a decision to be the leniency applicant? So two important points. I, it's been really wonderful discussing these issues with you both and a lot of fun and just a big thank you. 
Thank you, Creighton. Uh, João, uh, your final comments to, to, to the panel? Yeah, Paulo, I would also like to uh, thank you and Creighton uh, for us to have this discussion. It's always a pleasure. Uh, but uh, for people uh, who are listening to us, I believe that the most important message is that considering the, the Brazilian law, we have a, a certain reality five or six years ago in the criminal law before the car wash operation. Now we have a totally different reality uh, considering the position adopted by the courts, the instruments that are, are being used by the uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, the standard of proof that you demand in a criminal lawsuit. So uh, it, it, it's a changing environment uh, and both individuals and companies, they must be prepared because you never know what's really happening in all the divisions, departments of your company. Uh, what are, what's the situation in all the units that you have around the country. So uh, if uh, the companies are able to protect themselves in a proactive way, uh, these will certainly be, uh, uh, have positive results in the future. Thank you, Joel. I would like to thank uh, Creighton and Joel for, for participating in our uh, panel about uh, criminal liability to, to uh, individuals uh, for cartel content. I think my final word would be, well, besides these developments of new uh, rules for compliance, for acknowledgement of compliance programs, uh, new standards in the crim in Brazilian uh, criminal uh, law enforcement that overall, especially after the, the car wash uh, uh, scandal, but also in cartel cases, especially because many of the car wash investigations are related to bid rigging, which is agreements among competitors to fraud uh, procurement proceedings. So it's also an antitrust uh, infringement, and many of them are being also investigated by the competition authority. Uh, and besides all of that, we also have, and uh, I think that's my, my final comments to, to, to consider, is that we have this new world of companies transacting in the digital environment. And these will bring new, certainly new other challenges to companies uh, active, active in Brazil and, 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 and uh, as, as multinationals in other countries as well. I mean, uh, competition authorities will uh, uh, more and more focus, besides bid rigging, also focus on local and global uh, collusive behavior that, are, that can be uh, done in these environments through algorithms or artificial intelligence. And, and these will certainly have a criminal uh, feature to that. And that's something that companies should incorporate in their compliance programs in order to be aware that, well, as since companies are more and more going to, uh, uh, even if they are not tech companies, if they're not tech companies, I mean, if they are some motors, uh, shops and so on, but they are starting to work more on e-commerce or inter or have a B two B being part of a B two B platform in order to acquire inputs and so on. More and more, this kind of issue will be relevant. So this uh, certainly should be incorporated into uh, compliance programs because it can have both administrative and criminal uh, issues derived from some conduct in these on these contexts. I would like to thank everybody for participating in the panel, uh, for, for being with us. I think that's, that's the, the final panel of the conference. I hope you have enjoyed. And of course, we are at your disposal if you have any further questions after, after the conference. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you so much, everyone. Cheers.